أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام أحسب الناس أن يتركوا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون ولقد فتن الذين من قبلهم فلا يعلمن الله الذين صدقوا ولا يعلمن الكاذب أم حسب الذين يعملون السيئات أن يسبقونا ساء ما يحكمون من كان يرجو لقاء الله فإن أجل الله لآت وهو السميع العليم ومن جاهد فإنما يجاهد لنفسه إن الله إن الله لغني عن العالمين والذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لندخلنهم والذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لندكفرن عنهم سيئاتهم ولنجزينهم أحسن الذي كانوا يعملون والذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لنكفرن عنهم سيئاتهم ولنجزينهم أحسن الذي كانوا يعملون ووصينا الإنسان بوالديه حسنا وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ لِتُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٌ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا إِلَيَّ مَرْجِعُكُمْ فَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَنُ خلنهم في الصالحين ومن الناس من يقول آمنا بالله ومن الناس من يقول آمنا بالله فإذا أوذي في الله جعل فإذا أوذي في الله جعل فتنة الناس كعذاب الله ولئن جاء نصر من ربك ليقولن إنا كنا معكم أوليس الله بأعلم بما في صدور العالم وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّبِعُوا سَبِيلَنَا وَلْنَحْمِلْ خَطَايَاكُمْ 
وما هم بحاملين من خطاياهم من شيء إنهم لكاذبون ولا يحملن أثقالهم وأثقالا مع أثقالهم ولا يسألن يومئذ ولا يسألن يوم القيامة عما كانوا يفترون ولا يسألن يوم القيامة عما كانوا يفترون Jazak Allah khair. Um, Salaam alaikum. Ramadan Mubarak and a special thanks to all of you who are joining us tonight, especially during these uh, holy nights uh, in support of justice. Uh, my name is Dina Darian. I'm the executive director of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. As uh, Dr. Awesome mentioned, our, men our mission is to defend civil liberties and freedoms, promote a fair US criminal justice system and advocate for the rights of political prisoners targeted in the war on terror. These are victims of politically motivated prosecutions who were targeted based on their faith, activism, charity, or speech, or in unfair sting operations due to other vulnerabilities. CCF advocates for these prisoners through six program areas, education and outreach, grassroots advocacy, legal support for prisoners, prisoner and family support, research and tracking, and legislative advocacy. On this side of the pond, the coalition is the only organization in direct and regular contact with these victims of government overreach. We strive to serve both prisoners and their impacted family members who are left struggling with the ongoing trauma of their loved one's imprisonment. And we work to turn the victimization of these families into empowerment. This hands-on work with both groups is the heartbeat of our organization. Like CAGE, CCF emerged from the firsthand experience of its founder, who for many years battled for his freedom against the grossly inhumane US criminal justice system. It is indeed impossible to separate the work and mission of CCF from this context, since the focus of our work will always be guided and led by those who are directly affected, who fully understand the trauma and indignities of surveillance, incarceration, and prosecution, let alone a wholly manufactured prosecution, who realize that the trauma of such an experience will forever alter one's notions of freedom and justice, and even one sense of brotherhood, community, and citizenship. And even 17 years or a half a lifetime later, in my case, this trauma will still trigger anxiety, PTSD, and stress dreams involving a furtive stranger outside looking in. Many of you who are present for this webinar are here to listen to the extraordinary story of my father, Dr. Samuel Arian, whose case was one of the earliest political prosecutions in the post 9-11 era. But what you may not realize is that our story and our family's experience with what might now be called institutional Islamophobia began, began a full decade before his arrest. I grew up in Tampa, Florida, where my father was a professor and anti-war activist working on constitutional rights and Palestinian liberation. I remember what it felt like at just 10 years old to come home to a house that was turned upside down after every inch of it was raided by the FBI. I remember the anxiety I felt hearing footsteps of agents sneaking around our backyard for illegal searches and seizures. But more bizarrely, I now remember the conversations I had at that age, since I was forced to relive and listen to many of them years later, stored in boxes and boxes full of recorded phone calls in preparation for my father's six month long trial. Ironically, while he was being surveilled in the target of a malicious investigation and relentless smear campaign in the local paper, my father was simultaneously invited to lobby regularly on Capitol Hill, as one of few Muslim activists with influence in Washington. He was also a leader of the Tampa Muslim community and had founded the school and mosque we all attended. He campaigned against the unconstitutional use of secret evidence that was used to detain Arabs and Muslims in the 90s. Most notably, my beloved uncle, Dr. Mazen al-Najjar, another Palestinian intellectual who worked at a think tank my father founded at his university, which sought to bridge the gap between the Muslim world and the West. 
My uncle was unjustly imprisoned for five and a half years until his deportation a few short months before my father's arrest, or as we call it, volume two or the sequel. During my uncle's case, it was shocking to many people that the government could detain someone indefinitely and without charging them with any crime while insisting that any alleged evidence they had was a national secret so that no one, not the individual, not the judge, not a jury could ever see it. In a major effort to free my uncle and those like him, my parents la launched a national campaign to end the use of secret evidence. For his efforts, Newsweek magazine declared my father at the time the premier civil rights activist in the country. After working to get a bipartisan bill introduced, received hundreds of sponsors and nearly signed into law, the right wing and pro-Israel forces in the U.S. aggressively targeted my father to ensure that no Palestinian and no Muslim could ever carry political influence in this country or be seen as anything other than an, a national security threat. Not long after, the FBI raided our home once more in the early morning hours, but this time they arrested my father and vowed he'd never emerge as a free man. That day, Attorney General John Ashcroft delivered a nationally televised press conference declaring him a terrorist. My father would spend the next several years in prison, four of them in solitary confinement. Our community was gripped by fear and wanted nothing to do with my family. My mother was told she was no longer welcome at the mosque, but after 12 years, an $80 million trial with no guilty verdicts, hordes of attorneys, two legal cases, the government was forced to drop the charges because they had no evidence. So my father came to this country at age 17 as a stateless Palestinian refugee and built a life here. He was denied US citizenship because of his political activism, but it was the only place he called home. After his release, he was deported to Turkey and banned from U.S. soil, exiled to a country he had never visited, where he had no family and couldn't speak the language. Despite the injustice that happened to him, he managed to rebuild his life and resume his intellectual pursuits that seek to address the challenges in Muslim societies by founding the Center for Islam and Global Affairs at the Istanbul Sabah al-Din Zaim University. I've been very proud to follow the high quality scholarly research, journals, conferences, and webinar series the center has consistently produced. A loss for all of us in the United States, but most certainly a gain for the greater Muslim world. But I always think that it's a bit sad and ironic that my father's case, the arrest, the enormous financial strain, the alienation from the Muslim community, the torturous prison conditions, the media onslaught, the vindictiveness of rogue prosecutors and FBI agents, the debilitating hunger strikes, which I should add struck untold fear in the hearts of his family members, the exile in the permanent separation from his children and now his grandchildren, all of this, and it is still considered a victory and a success story. As I dedicate my life to this mission and justice work, I'm deeply excruciatingly aware that my family is one of the luckier ones. The case of Samuel Ariane is still considered a best case scenario for politically motivated charges of terrorism. There are many others like the founders of the largest Muslim charity in the US, the Holy Land Five, who are currently serving life sentences on similar charges. Still, the knowledge you gain from an experience like my family's from recognizing the power of a narrative and the media's ability to demonize an innocent person and instill fear in the public. A professor once asked me in front of my entire class if I was the daughter of the notorious Samuel Ariane, to being at the mercy of prison officials who may deny your loved one languishing in solitary confinement, visitation, or phone calls for months, because according to them, it's a privilege, not a right. The sleepless nights or the permanent sinking feeling in your stomach from not knowing how long this test will last, compounded by the crippling isolation from those who look at you in pity and turn away. This knowledge that you gain becomes a burden you carry. And it's why the coalition that my father conceived of while housed in a six by eight solitary cell carries out unique programs such as sending canteen money to prisoners and gathering impacted family members in a conference 
giving them a voice and working to empower them to reclaim our narrative. While we are proud of the advocacy work we do both on Capitol Hill and in the courtroom, we recognize the value and deep meaning these seemingly small efforts hold for those also burdened with that knowledge. This evening, I would like to convey my sincere gratitude to CAGE for long shouldering this responsibility and for being one of the most principled and courageous organizations advocating for our most vulnerable. I hope that all of you tuning in will generously contribute to sustain their critical work. To quote our dear sister, Afia Siddiqui, serving a horrific 86 year sentence, her unjust imprisonment is not simply her test, it is the test of the entire Ummah. And it is with great honor that I now welcome my father to share his story. Uh, thank you again, Brother Awesome, Brother Muazzam, for inviting me. It's a privilege uh, to be here with you in partnership. Thank you, Salaam Alaikum. Thank you so much, Lena. That was, I think, I, I, I speak for everyone when I say that I think we need to do a separate seminar just with you to learn from you and, and to learn more about your, your perspective on these things because I think it is, it is crucial for all of us. So, you know, yeah. and tonight, inshallah, I'll actually be co-hosting this evening with uh, our dear brother, Mazen Beg. Uh, we'll be uh, asking Dr. Sami a series of questions, uh, asking him to respond to them. Uh, brother, I'll, I'll be going first, asking uh, a series of three questions. We'll then break for a, a fundraising period of about 15 minutes, inshallah. And uh, after that, we'll move on, on to a uh, section with Brother Mars and where he'll enter into a conversation with Dr. Sami more about prisoner experiences, bismillah. So Dr. Sami, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, I, I guess my first question is really about, you know, where does this all really begin? Because, of course, it's not with 9-11. No, it didn't. Actually, the, the early beginnings were, I would say, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I was tracing this, and it started in, uh, uh, with the pro-Israeli groups. Uh, there are several uh, foundations and organizations that existed right around 1990, uh, 91. Uh, they started producing books and reports. They allied themselves with some Republicans in Congress. I was monitoring them at the time. Uh, it was it used to call the Republican Task Force on Terrorism. And actually, I visited the, the congressman who housed it, and he was the chairman of it. And he was an extremely Islamophobic guy, because he was from Florida, from Orlando. And then they started uh, expanding more and more. And then uh, they allied themselves with some uh, in the law enforcement agencies, particularly the FBI. And they started uh, conceiving of a, uh, of a law that where they can monitor Muslims. But this didn't take shape, uh, but until the first uh, World Trade Center bombing that took place in 1993. And I think this is when this whole thing started. And during my incarceration, I also found out that that's when they started also, uh, at least that's what they acknowledged, uh, full surveillance of myself. You know, I, um, they thought that I had access to about 18 lines of telephone, uh, 18 telephone lines, and they were monitoring each and every one of them. Uh, in 10 years, between 1993 and 2003, when I was arrested, uh, they had a collection of about 471,000 uh, phone calls and faxes and, and communications. So uh, that tells you that there was a whole focus on the Muslim community at the time. It wasn't just me, but of course, I was among the first. Uh, in 1995, they passed laws, 1996. Uh, it was introduced in 95, passed in 96, and that's when we, took, we, you know, we started taking notice uh, part of it was to use secret evidence, but it was so outrageous in the mindset of Americans, they were just applying this in immigration context. And the first 29 victims uh, between April 96 and April 98, because we were monitoring each and every one of them, 28 were Muslims, particularly Arabs, Palestinians, Iraqis at the time. So we knew that we were the targets. So that's when we started mobilizing. And of course, unfortunately, one of the uh, victims was, as uh, Lena said, uh, one of uh, my best friends, lifelong friends and, and, uh, and colleague and, uh, and also my uh, brother-in-law, Mazin Najjar. He was among the, the victims. And of course, they tried, when they arrest these people, try to uh, intimidate, try to uh, get them to, uh, to work for them, become informers, and so on and so forth, because they would have uh, other targets in mind. 
that. I mean, I think it, this is important for us to to realize because you know this was the emphasis really for a lot of your work um, for so long. Um, you know, trying to get justice for for you know this one person really. Of course, you have a very close connection to, but I think you understood the implications for for the wider Muslim community. It wasn't just him. I mean, as I said, it was, uh, you know, we started working on this before he even was. In 95, we went to Michigan, I believe, and, and we had uh, one of the, of the premier constitutional scholars, you know, invited him to brief us on this pending law. And he said, it's going to be devastating to civil liberties. And his view was that this is going to start with you guys because always U.S., uh, policy starts with minorities where people are, do not have defense and then they move into the larger uh, society. And that's what happened, of course, with the Patriot Act and others. So we knew about this before even my uh, brother-in-law was, was incarcerated. And of course, once he was, uh, you know, we obviously we needed to mobilize and, and we did. And we started by initiating uh, uh, three different uh, efforts and campaigns and two organizations, one local and one national. And the national organization uh, used to be called National Coalition to Protect Political Freedoms. Now this one is civil freedoms because we even lost that. But that one, uh, we, had, we started with 40, <coughs> excuse me, 40 organizations. Uh, many of them, actually the majority of them were non-Muslim. Uh, some of the Irish ones because they were targeted too. Even though uh, they had all kinds of freedoms after the Good Friday Accord, uh, but before that, remember the Good Friday Accord happened a year after we were founded and they were part and parcel of the organization when we started because they were using secret evidence against them too because of the close, uh, close uh, connection with the UK government on the IRA and others. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, this thing uh, has broader meanings. They start with minorities and then they expand to the whole population after it becomes normative. So, you know, what's, what's obviously fascinating, well, I'm sorry, I said obviously, but what many people don't know about your case is that this campaigning led to strange bedfellows, should we say, um, as you went on. And, you know, I don't want to give too much of the story away by saying what the end result was, but, you know, you, you ended up very close to Republicans of all people, um, you know, oh. the very people who'd come into power. So could you tell us a bit about how that, how that happened? Yeah, right, right. Well, you see, when we started in 97, when we established the National Coalition, the NCPCF, and uh, we knew that we have really a long road ahead, and this is to be, you know, slow climbing, and it's going to be a lot of, a lot of hard work. But we knew that, that what the steps were. The first step, usually, in any campaign to reach success, uh, especially when, it, when, it, when you're trying to change the law and, and change how people perceive it, you start public campaign, education campaign. And we started that in 97 and 98, dozens of lectures around the country, you know, all Muslim conferences, they would be very reluctant to touch it, but we will force ourselves in, and, and have some kind of a session or two, bring prominent people. So I had, you know, we had to establish all kinds of connections, especially with, at that time with former congressmen, because no congressman would actually touch us. After that, we started with the media. So we visited all kinds of uh, editorial boards across the country. I think within two years, we produced 50, at least 50 editorials against secret evidence. And at the third, uh, the third campaign, you know, after media, we had also also 200 featured stories on, on the families of secret evidence victims. Uh, the third campaign was political one. That's when you reach, after you win politically, or at least have some kind of acceptance within the political establishment, that's when the legal side and the courts will start listening and ruling in your favor. So the third stage was politics. How do we get into that? And Muslims do have some uh, uh, close congressmen, uh, especially in areas where there are uh, uh, majority of Muslims or at least uh, donors. And in my case, when I looked, I found out that there was this particular gentleman. He was very much uh, high rank within the Democratic Party. Democrats were a minority in Congress at the time, but he was, uh, he was the second ranking. So I went and visited him. His name is David Bonnier. He immediately got, I mean, he's civil libertarian also. He immediately got what I was talking about and immediately joined the cause. And he said, what can I do for you? <clears throat> Actually, I was taken aback because I wasn't expecting him to immediately embrace us. So we told him we need to, uh, we need to uh, uh, have legislation to ban secret evidence. So to make the long story short, we started a campaign. I brought some Republicans also, you know, some constitutional scholars. And we got some members of our community introducing me to other people. So slowly but surely, we started this campaign. We got the ACLU. 
we got other National Lawyers Guild and other uh, civil liberties organizations. We drafted the law. We got it through four Congress people. And it's a fascinating story, but it's very detailed. So I'm not going to bore you with that. But at the end of the campaign, from, I'd say, politically from October 98 until about <coughs> January 2000, about a year and three months, uh, we were able to get over 100 congressmen. And by, the, uh, by September, 129 Congress people who signed to this legislation, including the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, who was very difficult. His name was Henry Hyde, very, very prominent Republican. But I, I got to him, he was from Chicago, from our community members there, because they were donating to his uh, campaign. So you have to know how to talk to these people and get them in. I brought him to Tampa, that's where we were. Aware. And he was astonished because he saw in a meeting of several hundred people that there were so many non-Muslims, bishops and pastors and, and, and all kinds of prominent people. So that got his attention. And of course, we raised money for him as well. So uh, by, by the summer of 2000, uh, we were, uh, we had a hearing. It was in our favor, really. And then we had a markup, meaning uh, they voted in the Judiciary Committee 26 to 2 in our favor, which was an absolute shock to many. Because most organizations, you know, Muslim organizations, they didn't think, they, they were calling this a losing issue. We're not going to waste our time uh, on this losing issue. But remember, this was a, a, uh, a, presidential, camp a presidential year, presidential election year, which meant, and there was no incumbent. It was Gore and George W. Bush. And I had, you know, people on both campaigns talking with them constantly. Uh, if they're going to uh, sign uh, with us on this issue, if they can promote it like we did, because I had difficulty with Republicans in Congress. Uh, by October, and, I've, you know, as I said, I was talking to both campaigns, it became very clear that this is a very tight race. So I get a call in October 2000 from uh, a very prominent Republican, actually, very close to Karl Rove. And he asked me, uh, it was at night, uh, what would it take for the Muslim community to endorse George W. Bush? He wanted just that extra half percent or one percent where they can make a difference. And I said, it's very you know, easy. <laughs> Grover, his name was. It's very easy. Well, what you have to do is have him uh, 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 support the banning of secret evidence and say something against it and support our legislation in Congress. Uh, and he was part of this campaign, that friend of mine who was introducing me to different Republicans. And the next day, something happened that I wasn't expecting at all. It was a uh, second debate. And the format was that it was uh, the, uh, the Jim Lehrer, who was the uh, moderator, Bush and Gore. He asked Gore a question regarding uh, racial profiling, which is used against African-Americans. And of course, uh, uh, Gore denounced it. Then he turned to George W. Bush to get his reaction about racial profiling. So he pivoted immediately to secret evidence. He said, yeah, this is wrong, but there is another form of racial profiling. He made it like that. And it's called secret evidence. And this is wrong. And it's un-American. Must stop. And this is used against Arabs and Muslim Americans. And there is legislation in Congress by Spencer Abraham that must pass. <laughs> I was frankly shocked. You know, 62 million Americans just heard the campaign that I've been working on now for years. And, you know, half an hour later, after it ended, I get a call from this guy and said, I delivered. Are you going to deliver now? I said, of course, you know, you, uh, you did deliver. Let me see what I can do. So I, we gathered all the Muslim leaders, all the major organizations, and we decided that evening to endorse George W. Bush based simply on this uh, promise of ending, uh, but for, for a reason. Because we thought, and I, say, I think it was a sound thinking, that communities, especially minorities, they don't become uh, empowered until they win their civil rights battle. And this was the, the, our civil rights battle. If they could use secret evidence against us, we would never be able to rise again. So we had to stop this and then move forward. Since he was willing to do that, we're going to forget all other sins. We're not going to talk about Palestine or Iraq or any other thing. You know, we were not naive or oblivious to the fact where Republicans stood on many issues of concern to the Muslims and to the minorities there. But we were very much focused on this. And we thought if we win this, we can get access to others. <clears throat> now, of course, no one knew, <laughs> knew the future, what's gonna happen in the future. But anyway, so we started and uh, 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 we endorsed them the following Monday. We identified six states in which we can make a difference. Uh, one of them was Florida and it was, it was my responsibility. So we went there full force. We uh, mobilized the Muslim community there. Usually Muslims 
uh, vote three to one Democrats. That year it was reversed. About 74% of Muslims in Florida voted for Bush and he won Florida by 537 votes, which means that our vote certainly made a difference. And by winning Florida, he won the presidency. And it took months, if you, believe, if, if you remember, before it was, it was actually certified. And actually on the eve of his inauguration, I was invited to attend his inauguration and I was thanked in a private uh, celebration by uh, three prominent Republicans. One of them was Newt Gingrich, his former Speaker of the House. Uh, another was the head of the Congressional Republican Committee, Tom Davis. And the third was John Sununu, who was also the Chief of Staff of the early uh, President Bush. And we started asking now that you need to deliver on secret evidence. And they said, we're working on it. And by August, we started the campaign again in Congress. We had over 100 sponsors, co-sponsors. And they called me in August and said, okay, we're ready now to end secret evidence. So this is your best day that you've been waiting for. You need to give us, to get us all the uh, Muslim uh, leaders around the country. I called everybody. Everybody went to Washington. Unfortunately, that day was 9-11. Yeah, Rob, serious, on the day that we're going to end secret evidence, it ends up being the day that really cements it. Uh, yeah, I mean, to, no, I, no, no, we went from secret evidence to no evidence. I mean, to no evidence, right? Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> manufactured evidence. Yeah. Right, absolutely, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. And I guess this, the, you know, this moment, of course, 9-11, you know, while we don't treat it in the way that, say, a lot of people who take a, a, a Western or Eurocentric view take it, which is like, this is an exceptional moment in history because, of course, we know that all manner of atrocities take place every single day throughout the world. You know, I guess in some ways, America has never really been attacked on its own soil in this way. And so, of course, you have this, this moment where a lot of legislation is being rushed through. What was, I guess, my last question to you is kind of around the environment and the feeling that was prevalent in the U.S. leading up to your arrest. You know, can you give us a, a sense for how the community you know, felt and how it responded to, to this moment? Uh, you know, I was running university, I was a professor at university running a school, Muslim school. It was one of the saddest, most difficult days in our lives. You know, uh, suddenly something happened, you know, Muslims, and it's not just this organization or that organization or that individual. All Muslims around the world became suspects. Uh, we immediately, we, we uh, our school is, in, is a dead end street. You know, we had something like 12, 14 acres. And suddenly we have every single TV station and news uh, reporter on our soil. You know, all the children are terrified of what's going on. And we became suspects. And of course, uh, for the next two weeks, I was just going from one place to another, you know, on, short, on, on, on TV, on, on different community organizations, you know, trying to, uh, to, 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 to uh, talk about this and try to dispel the myth. And we were, I think we were making some progress because a lot of people were, were, were pushing back those who would like to, uh, with, 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 with broad brush, indict the Muslims. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, something happened in which I, I, because I was also a target way before this uh, by uh, pro-Zionist groups. They were trying to get me fired from the university years before, starting in 94, actually. And uh, I was suspended, in fact, from teaching. And the investigation was launched. Uh, for two years, at the university, when they came back and said he did absolutely nothing wrong and I was reinstated. So they were after me. But by that time, we had a different uh, university uh, president. Uh, she was also Zionist. She had, her family has its own foundation in Israel. And she was trying to find the pretext to terminate me. And to terminate a professor in the U.S. is extremely difficult. It's not something easy if you're tenured. And, uh, and they took that. Uh, opportunity because I was on one of these programs. It was a setup and I wasn't really, I was careless to tell you the truth because I wanted to get our message out and I didn't investigate the host uh, because I didn't have Fox on my uh, channel at the time as uh, my channel list. So I, I wasn't familiar with, uh, with this guy, you know, O'Reilly. So when I appeared and as was a setup, I was ambushed. Couldn't get much into that interview and it was used to, uh, uh, to, uh, basically uh, suspend me and then she took the opportunity to try to fire me so it become that case become became the most important academic freedom 
issue since Angela Davis in the 1960s. So not only you're fighting Islamophobia and Islamophobes and all these kinds of things, you're trying to save your reputation and your career, which became you know, even doubly uh, more difficult. And then because it became a national issue, then you know, other programs uh, of, of national uh, uh, reputation became taking interest in my case and being watched by the millions. And it was all of it were pretty much distortions. And you couldn't, you can't lose. The US has these very <laughs> liberal laws when it comes to uh, 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 libel. <laughs> because uh, if you are a public person, uh, then any, anything is, is, is open. You can't, you can't sue people. You, know, you really have to prove that they had certain intention. It takes years to do that with millions of dollars, which I don't have. So my reputation was, was taking a hit. Uh, I was everywhere, but we were fighting back. So we had uh, good editorials and columns from, you know, even Washington Post and New York Times at, at the time. Uh, so the Zionists were not happy with this. So they started pushing the government more, especially the university president, because now she is facing, uh, she is facing uh, sanctions from the most prominent academic organization in the country because of how, the way she treated me. And they gave her a deadline, unless I'm reinstated, they are going to censure the university. And that would have been a big deal because that means uh, many prominent professors wouldn't come, student societies uh, cannot function and so on and so forth. So felt she can't do anything. So she went running to the government, asking them to do something. And this is something that is unprecedented. You know, when a US attorney uh, would announce the impaneling of a grand jury, usually all these things happen in secret. That happened in, this, in, in February because the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, warning came to the university that they need to uh, uh, reinstate me by August. So August came, nothing happened. So she sends my lawyer uh, a proposal to pay me a million dollars and resign. So I ask, all right, give it to me in writing, I'll consider it. But the chairman of that university, the chairman of the board, wouldn't do it. So I've been calling this guy a terrorist. Now he's telling me, give him a million dollars. That's over my dead body. She said, I can't do anything. He said, okay, just let me, let me handle it. So he went to Jeb Bush, who was the, <coughs> the, the brother of the president. And he was also the governor of Florida. And he is the one who appointed this guy. He was a very wealthy Republican. So they said, okay, just delay what you can so you don't get censured. We'll see what we could do. And I could see this. Uh, unfolding when I was uh, privy to my um, discovery, trying to find out, you know, what information they could use. And I could see how this thing, it started, you know, the, the, the grand jury started meeting. Usually they meet one or two days a month. These people were meeting daily and fed all kinds of, of, of lies and fabrications and nonsense. But of course, it's one side. So by, uh, so they go and sue me, sue me to fire me, asking the courts to fire me, which, which is nonsensical in the, in the, uh, U.S. court system, but it takes about four months. So they lose in state court, they take it to federal court, they lose in federal court, but they bought themselves four months before they get censured. Two months later, I was arrested uh, based on this bloated, which I, I never thought that it'd come to that. I thought they may, you know, cook up something has to do with immigration or something. But I found out that they investigated every aspect of my life. When I say that, everything, every single penny I ever earned or spent since 87, uh, they had accounting uh, for it. They went through anything that I ever owned and to see if there is any fraud, my taxes. Actually, I found out that they went to my accountant and under secrecy, the accountant will give me every month, every year, sorry, uh, my taxes. And within the same day, he will be forwarding them my own taxes so they can go investigate to see if they can get something on me. And I found I was, because this is against the law. If the FBI wanted to go to IRS, it's by law, they cannot get it. So they were getting it from actually my accountant who was giving me hints, but I was naive. You know, I never, he retired and I said, why did you go to go find someone else? And I said, no, I like you. And, and there he go. He was doing my taxes and giving a copy to the, to the government. So, you know, there are stories and stories to do, to say this. Lena mentioned, you know, when they raided our twi uh, houses twice, twice and they, you know, they took everything that they, could carry in, including also in our center, you know, that I had center research that she mentioned, it was called World and Islam Studies Enterprise. And uh, they took everything, and which compelled us to have to close it, they froze its accounts and so on and so forth. It's just uh, one way to shut people up uh, when they don't have anything. But once they have these people and they needed to bail out this, you know, uh, this president, 
So the, I think what happened is that the, the, pre, the, the brother of the president went to the White House because we have these records and he asked him to do something. That's when the grand jury start meeting almost on a daily basis and they reach this uh, loaded indictment. Allah. Yeah, Dr. Sami, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, great to see you, brother. Um, of course, I've seen you before, and the last time was uh, a couple of weeks ago in this almost a similar format. We got a taste about your life, but we never really got the depth or the, or the detail. And I certainly never got to ask the questions um, that I wanted. Um, I've heard about you uh, from my colleagues who've met you, and I've heard about you before uh, through uh, the work of CCF and also uh, reading about your case. Uh, tell me first, before anything, you, you said last time that this is the first time that you'd spoken about this case in any, any great detail outside. Can you tell me what, what, what is it that prompted you to do that? <clears throat> well, uh, I, of course, your organization is unique. And therefore, uh, I feel very comfortable sharing my experiences uh, with the members of the organization. That's one thing. But the other thing is most venues that I was invited to, no one asked me actually to talk about my experience. It's not like I was asked and, and, and I, I declined. It just, it, it never happened. I mean, it, if it happens, it happens just in passing, you know. Uh, it will be, I'll be talking about all kinds of issues. Uh, even sometimes what happens in, uh, in terms of Islamophobia within the, the, the US, but not directly about my experience. Uh, I would be asked maybe individually, privately, about you know certain aspects, but I don't think I ever I ever made a speech just simply on my experience and lessons learned or something like that. So it's a it's a double honor then for us, and it's also an exclusive, uh, unique thing for us. Um, I, I, something that Lena was talking about was the effects of the family, or on the family rather, of your detention. C can you just explain to me the first days? Because I want to see if there's any parallels from either myself or with other prisoners that we've come across, and I'm sure there are, of what it was like that when you were first taken, your house was raided and you were taken, you were arrested and you were kept in. Um, tell me a little bit about that process and what the first few days were, because I think the first few days are always the most crucial and the most, most difficult. Well, because of the drumming up of the media and, and other parties, I expected something was going to happen. Uh, we were in January, the university lost its cases. Now I'm suing them, and it was the, the whole atmosphere was 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 electric, you know. Uh, so, but I never expected what what happened, what came, you know, with this massive indictment, dozens and dozens of agents, and with this, you know, they took me, and I have all the, you know, the whole media of the world uh, was there. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was it was pleasure time when I was arrested. It's interesting because the, the agent, the arresting agent, you know, he came and whispered in my ears. He took me aside and handcuffed me and said, <clears throat> you are charged with, and he wouldn't even say it. He would spell it. I mean, he said it like, you know, taking like five seconds saying the word terrorism, like he's celebrating. And then TV cameras, you know, when this was happening, five o'clock in the morning. How the hell did they know about it? He said, or they listened to our, of course, he, they, they called him in. It was, it, was, it was staged. And then he would, he would drive me past the mosque and he said, you will never see this mosque ever again, you know, trying to break me down. And it's interesting because uh, two weeks before I came to Turkey, I asked for their permission. When Turkey asked for me, they, they, they relaxed the rules and I was able to go to Tampa and give a khutbah in that mosque. And I told him at the time that I was told that I would never this, this, see this mosque again. And it was full. You know, we had, you know, anyway, so. Uh, yeah, so, so tell, tell me that, um, what was going through your mind when they took you first into the into a police cell and started to interrogate you? And then, uh, you know, did you get the sense that they really want to put me away for a long time? Is of that course, you, of course, you know that, you know, because I understood, I, I understand the American system very well. I understand how they work. And I knew that I would never talk with them. They took me, of course. And once you tell them I want my lawyer, they stop talking to you. So that's the first thing I said, I said, I need, I need my lawyer. So they stopped talking to me and said, can we talk about Iraq? Because the Iraq invasion was pending. So they start, we started talking politics. But uh, yeah, I was, I, was, I was taken there, you know, and, and uh, you know, I didn't realize that uh, Jan Ashcroft, the attorney general, was actually the one who announced the indictment and, and all that. So I was totally isolated uh, for a month. And of course, I started my hunger strike immediately. 
But that was the first, you know, I went through three different hunger strikes. The first one uh, lasted uh, over 100 days, but this was, you know, the first 30 days was, was without uh, uh, liquids. And then after that, I was taking liquids, you know, basically like on a diet or something. So they didn't consider that as a real hunger strike. I only um, uh, suspended it after uh, I was, I, I fired all my lawyers that they were appointed and started representing myself until I was able to uh, afford one. Uh, I went through another hunger strike, you know, years later. Uh, that was very painful. That was for 60 days. And that was with water. Did they, try, did they try to force feed you there? Do they have a process of force? Well, I was, I, you know, I, I, after 22 years, I, I, I passed out and I hit my head on the sink. I was trying to make wudu. So they took me to the hospital and then they tra it took me to a prison hospital. Uh, I was uh, federal prison and I was under monitor 24 hours. And every day they were uh, threatening me to force feed me. And of course, I lost over 55 pounds at the time. And then I suspended it after 60 days because, you know, the, the political message that I wanted was, was received. And then I went through another, you know, a year later, another one for 55 days, where the first 18 days was with, without water. And there was a reason for this because I was asked to go to the grand jury because it was this second case. It wasn't about the first, you know, even after I beat them the first time and we won our case, they, they had another case. So these two hunger strikes because, were because of that other case, not because of the original one. But my family, yeah. this is the most painful thing. You know, um, whenever you think about it, you know, you see how much they had to suffer. And, you know, my son heard about it actually from TV and uh, because he, both of them, one was in London. My son actually was in London. My daughter was in DC and they have to watch from the TV. My other members of the family, they were terrified when they came to the house. They couldn't leave the house. They couldn't do anything. And, and they had to stay the full day while they were searching every aspect of our, uh, of our house. And then they had to endure not only the fear and terror of that moment, but also the, uh, the rejection or the look that they would get uh, from the same, unfortunately, school and mosque and this, because people were terrified. You know, I'm not blaming anybody. I think the FBI did pretty good in trying to intimidate every member of our community. Everybody had a visit, everybody was uh, sort of threatened and they felt unwelcome and it took years for that to, uh, to repair. You know, eventually my wife had to take my children out of that school because they felt alienated and that of course affected them tremendously. Uh, I mean, this, this is, is the type of, of things we'll try to save other families from. Yeah, I mean, this is something that we've had, of course, here in the UK. There have been many arrests of, in different cases, and even with the Guantanamo prisoners, including my own family in the beginning, that there was a sense of fear from the community. But after a certain time, they started to come together and build and get support, actually, from a lot of non-Muslims, which we have to accept. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is that when you were in prison, of course, the concept in, in countries like Britain, America, and Australia, and so forth, is that they don't have something called political prisoners. Perhaps they have them in the Arab countries, but political prisoners, they say that we don't have a, such a thing. Now, when you were in prison, in the various prisons that you were in, um, did the other inmates see you as a political prisoner or did they see you as how the government had tried to paint you, i.e. as a sponsor of terrorism and so forth? Uh, how would other people look at you? You're a professor, you're an imam, you're an activist, you've been recognized alongside people like Malcolm X and and Martin and, uh, and uh, Muhammad Ali as, as a dissident. How did they see you? <clears throat> as I said, I was in two different phases. The first phase was actually in prison and that stayed for about 2020 days. And then I was under, under house arrest for about five and a half years. Uh, the first 2020 uh, days, I was only in the general population for 75 days. Uh, during these 75 days, which, start, you know, after the 75 days, they started the second case. That's why it was, was uh, disrupted. Uh, I was a celebrity on, actually, in the prison ground. You know, they called me professor, and everybody was celebrating me because I beat the government. And to them, beating the government is the highest rank you can ever achieve, you know, as, as prison. <clears throat> and I had double protection. You know, in prison life in the U.S., you must have protection. You have to belong to a group, otherwise... Anybody can, 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 can beat you up or anybody can uh, really uh, walk all over you. So I had the protection of the Muslims and I felt that the first day, you know, a group of them came with the Muslim community here, you're under our protection, here's your toothpaste and here's your toothbrush and here's this and here's that. 
And I also, the, the guy who was next to me was from Sicily. You know, he's an American, but he was Italian descent. He was also uh, the holder of the, uh, of the boxing uh, silver medal in the 1968 Olympics. You know, very tough guy. And uh, his relationship with the mafias. So I became his <laughs> friend, so I was protected by the mafias too. Double protection. <laughs> no, double protection, so no one can actually touch me. And during these days, you know, I felt what it means to be a prisoner. I mean, federal prison has good, good ways. And, and of course, if you're, if you're a target, it, it could be very, very difficult. But uh, the, the, yes, on, on these 75 days, I was basically uh, very much celebrated. And uh, uh, I, as far as the, so, so the system, you know, you're, you're a, a high profile prisoner. Um, this is happening in and around what 2005, 2006. Is that right? This this story was in 2006. Yes, 2006. Yeah. So by, by this time, the war in Iraq has happened. Uh, Afghanistan has already happened. Guantanamo is set up. the The whole process of the war on terror is in full swing, and that's one of the reasons why you're actually being targeted. So I wanted to ask you, you to what degree were you aware about Guantanamo? about secret evidence used to help pe hold people and the fact that there were also mass hunger strikes taking place there. Um, well, I was very much aware because I, uh, you know, my family uh, had subscription for the New York Times. So I was reading the New York Times every single day, every single part of it. So I was very much aware of it. And also I had another publication that comes from London, Al-Quds al, al Arabi at the time in Arabic. Yeah. So we had that. So the, with these two, I, and then of course you had your uh, transistor radio you know, I always would listen to Democracy Now and others, and I would get full reports. You know, I was very much aware of what's going on outside. Yeah. And, and were you aware also then, um, because one of the things that happened with us is that you, they had American uh, soldiers uh, who were reservists who'd actually were working as prison guards on, uh, uh, sometimes uh, we had people who worked on death row would come along then and use their methods on, on us. Were you aware uh, of, I guess the question really is, is that was there a sense of, uh, anti uh, Islamophobia amongst some of the prison officers or the prison system, or was it were they kind of equally treating everybody? Well, many of the uh, many of the prison guards in the U.S. are veterans of U.S. wars, mm -hmm. so a lot of people, yes, they were in Afghanistan or Iraq, and we will have discussions. And of course, at the beginning, they were so suspicious suspicious of me. I was very much uh, I was badly treated, you know, uh, unlike other prisoners, you know, and criminals. So, for example, for about I think close to nine weeks, I was, you know, whenever I meet with my attorney, they wouldn't carry my stuff. And because when they transfer you, you have to, to, to be handcuffed from the back, I couldn't carry my stuff. So I would put it on my back and I would be walking, you know, hunched over like this for about a mile, which was crazy. You know, nine weeks like that because they wouldn't uh, carry my, my, my stuff and they hated me. But after a while, they started to know me more and they started having, uh, you know, basically respect. And they understood that what they have been told it was, was a bunch of lies, and that's not who we were. But at the same time, there are rules that they can't violate. I mean, what you're saying is just, you know, you, you just sent a shiver down my spine because you know how they used to transport us? The way they transported us as prisoners, they used to tie our hands behind our back, and they used to put us into the record position mm -hmm. and make us with a, a soldier with pushing on one way and another soldier pushing it the, the other way, and you had to walk like that. Um, yeah. And those very same soldiers, who in the beginning treated like that, us like that, some of those soldiers have actually come to the UK and visited me as friends mm -hmm. after seeking forgiveness. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask you, um, have you, has there be, were there any instances between you and people, either interrogators or, so, or, or uh, guards, where they actually realized what had been done was a great injustice? Well, uh, first of all, no interrogations, because uh, in your, yeah, and you. as well, if you say, my lawyer, they stopped interrogation and they, they can't sure. force you. Sure. But, on, but of course they were taping, you know, so whatever, and, but it didn't make a difference. Uh, but in terms of <clears throat> treatment, some of them were, were nice, decent people, and others were, were, were monsters. You know, at one point I remember, I, I went to through 14 different prisons in the US. Some of them were very, very harsh. You know, others were reasonable in terms of, you know, but prison life is prison life. But in one instance, particularly, I had this very abusive prison guard who start, you know, doing all kinds of stuff, abusing me, tight, you know, tightening the, 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 uh, the chains around my, my hand, pushing me, hitting me through the, the, uh, the wall and so on and so forth. So I complained one time to the judge and he asked me that I must have information. 
So I did, the second time he did it, <clears throat> I gave him the information, but nothing happened. Uh, so we made a complaint to the Justice Department, and usually it goes to an independent uh, ombudsman within the Justice Department. And uh, but because so many people, I mean, this is the other thing about how you campaign. One thing that was different in my case than the others is the amount of publicity and campaign we were able to engender. So we had thousands of people asking the Justice Department why you are not investigating this incident, <clears throat> which eventually they, they did. And they came to me and said, we usually investigate one out of 10,000 cases, and yours is one of them. So it's described to us what happened to you. So to make a long story short, when I identified the, these guards, they went and they talked to them and they said, it's your word against them. They deny it. The only way, they were so sure that I wouldn't agree to it. The only way we can continue this investigation if you agree to take a lie detector test. So my lawyer was reluctant. I said immediately, I would take one, no problem. So they gave me one. And after the end, you know, he told my lawyer that he, he uh, passes with flying colors. So they went and they gave him to the other guys and they flunked. So uh, I don't know what happened to them, but that was one way how they, uh, you know, they said that they have been uh, punished. I don't know what kind of punishment they were given, but, but it wasn't the, the way, because outside the U.S., basically there are no rules, except for there where they make the rules to be. So I, so I was calling my uh, incarceration, you know, Guantanamo minus, uh, yeah, because we had we had a little bit more than when, what you guys had at the time. But, you know, when I went, one of the shockest moments for me was when I went from county jail, even though it was my first experience with prison, so it was horrifying. But it was nothing compared to federal prison, where you're in solitary, you're denied almost everything. Uh, you get only 15 minutes a month of call and call. But I learned something also. This is another prison story that uh, stick in my mind. You know, the first night I went to first federal prison, my mother was sick and I was calling her almost daily. So when I went there, I promised her that I'm going to call her to check up on her because she was sick. But when I went to federal prison, they told me uh, you get only 15 minutes a month, one month from now. So I pleaded with the uh, associate warden is that the, my mother is sick, just give me one 15 minutes and then I'll wait one month. So she promised to give it to me the following day. But the following day was a weekend, so she wasn't there. And I asked for my phone call, they denied it to me. And there, you know, this is an all solitary unit. I have all Muslims there, a lot of Muslims there. So they started banging on the doors, making so much noise. And I, I you know, I understood the, the, the beauty of solidarity right there. Of course, if you are going to be a disruptor, you will be punished. So they, they came with the video cameras trying to show that I'm a disruptor. And I was sitting there and my brothers were doing everything, all the noise in the world, until eventually they had to call her at home and, and give me my phone call. So I, I, I learned that night how important solidarity is and how it works and how it brings results. I mean, Dr. Sani, uh, to be honest with you, we could speak for, for such a long time. There's such, we, I think we've only just scratched the surface. And I know that we're, we're closing towards time, but it's Ramadan. And you spent several, was it 12 Ramadans in prison? No, um, no. I spent uh, six Ramadans in prison. Six Ramadans in and, prison. Uh, and six Ramadan. In house arrest. In house arrest. But you know what's interesting also is that I went through three phases. Now, I was thinking about this just today. Every time I went from phase one to phase two, it was always in Ramadan. 2008, that's when I got out on house arrest. 2013, that's when they relaxed my house arrest. And 2014, Ramadan, also first day of Ramadan, that's when they dismissed the case. So, so my last question... My last, question, my last question to you is, is then definitely going to be about something that's very, you know, some people find it odd, but it's close to my heart. And that is spending Ramadan alone, completely alone, isolated. Tell me in, in your words, um, how you spent any one year of Ramadan alone. And was it, as some people might think, a time of great sadness or was it a great, a great time of you building your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or was it both? Well, it's very difficult uh, for people to, to, uh, to, to understand unless they experienced it. You know, um, the moment I went to, uh, to prison, uh, I stayed on my tahajjud on taraweeh every single day in prison, the whole time. So to me, it was like every day was Ramadan. I also maintained the, of course, with hunger strike, you don't eat anything. It's worse than Ramadan in that respect. But also after that, I always would fast Mondays and Thursdays and the three days in between. So during the, the, the year, you fast about what? 130, 140 days. So it's like Ramadan becomes just another occasion 
by which you, you increase your spirituality. I mean, it's, I, mean I was on a different spiritual plane. Yani when you go through this experience, especially if you are alone or with someone that you're praying with, uh, it's, it's a completely different, different experience. I can tell you one story, though, that uh, one day I went from prison to another prison when they were taking me from my first case to the second case. And in between, we went to Oklahoma. That's where they have the, most of the transfer happens in Oklahoma prison, because it's actually an airport strip. And this is so far away from the family now, Florida and Oklahoma. Wait, wait. I mean, thousands, Oklahoma, of miles, thousands of miles. So I was taken there, a plane with 150 people. And when we landed, they put me on one line and all 149 in another line. So, uh, you know, after strip search and all kinds of shenanigans, as if I was coming from outside and I was from another prison, for God's sake. They took me, it was also the first day of Ramadan. So I was fasting and they put me on solitary. Everybody else was on the ground. I was the only person. And then I never faced this case before where you are the only one in, sol in, in solitary. Sometimes you may have a few others that you can shout through the glass or do something or ask them. But this is, was completely alone in a room that was windowless. And that has nothing because I don't have any property. I don't have a Quran. I don't have blanket. I don't have pillow. I don't have anything. And this is Ramadan. And for three days, you're sitting there. All what you're doing is trying to obviously read the Quran that you know and go over it. You have no idea what time it is. No idea whatsoever. There's no indication whether, you know, it's, you, you guess. It's only guessing. Uh, twice a day, somebody's going to come, open the slot. It's like dog, you know, thing. They throw the tray. 15 minutes later, they come and collect. You don't even see their face for three continuous days. It is during these times where you can actually think about the most important things in life. And you make decisions that, you know, that either you accept it or you, you, you become totally depressed and, and, and alienated and, and, and totally lose control and even lose sanity. It's like putting you in a bathroom in your own house, just think you're in the bathroom. People now <laughs> complain about, you know, being locked down and they have in houses and they can go outside and talk over the phone and the internet and Zoom and this and that. But here we're talking about being in a room that is no more than 50 square feet, three continuous days with nothing except, you know, trying to stay, and, and, and during Ramadan, try to stay sane and with no communication with anybody. So you these know, are days, but they make you stronger. You know, I, I've, I've done so many talks in universities around this country. And one of the things that I've said repeatedly, because when people ask, what's it like to be in a cell? I say, imagine the smallest room in your house, which is probably the bathroom or the toilet. And then imagine being locked in there for, uh, for three, four, five, 10, 15 years. Yeah. That's what it's like. You can't imagine it. You couldn't put yourself in the bathroom for two hours, let alone one. Um, so it's, it's amazing, as I said, that, you know, you and I, have similar experiences, though we're in different places. Uh, and I know many other people from other parts of the world had similar experiences. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the Prophet uh, Yusuf alayhi salam famously said, Rabbi sijna habu That's one of the reasons why you remained in prison because prison was more, you, you were more prepared to go to prison than to, to give up your fight for, for justice. And alhamdulillah, it's been a pleasure and an honor to speak to. I hope that we continue to have these conversations as time continues and that you continue our, uh, your relationship with Cage and we continue it with the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. Questions in the Q&A asking about the dreams that you saw in prison. There is, a, there is a great deal of interest in this one subject. So I'm afraid you're not going to be able to avoid it. Um, so if you could please share some of your, uh, your dream stories with us, that would be, it would be very much appreciated. Exactly. Well, I'll give you two. Okay. And uh, I never, the fourth, I never told anybody. So because it hasn't happened yet, so I'm not gonna share it with anybody, but I'll give you two of the three. Uh, the first one actually happened in uh, February, 2005. We were a few months away from the trial, and I thought my lawyers were not doing a good job. They were not defending this. We haven't even selected a single witness. Uh, there were so many phone calls that they should translate. Because they haven't been translated to respond. I did not quite understood the way this case is going to be tried. Of course, my lawyer was, was very competent, you know, two of my lawyers, great lawyers, you know, uh, Bill, Bill Moffitt, who passed away, and Linda Moreno, they had a different way of trying the case. And I'm saying, you know, I'm thinking, at one point he said, how many witnesses do you have? So, you know, I already pre prepared, I said 275. <laughs> it was crazy because I thought they were looking for the truth and they weren't. He said, this is not how these things are tried. So I was in a constant fight with them and I wasn't pleased with the way they were preparing for the case. 
And I, because of this, I was pretty depressed. You know, I was trying to translate myself and do all kinds of things. And, you know, at the time they put me in a women section of the prison because they didn't want me to talk to any people, even through the pipes. So I was totally isolated, you know, because it's in a women section. So all the cells around me were empty. So I'm in a prison inside the unit, inside the whole wing that it's totally empty. I'm the only person, maybe 60 cells or something. And, and usually at three o'clock in the morning, I'm diabetic, so they come and check my diabetes. So I was sleeping in, and obviously in the dream, it, was, it looks like reality. So three o'clock in the morning, they come and they check your diabetes. So in the dream, I'm seeing this, you know, they're bringing this uh, uh, cart with the medical thing. And usually they will, they will turn on the lights and then they open the door. So I'm hearing this coming and waiting for them to turn on the lights, but they open the door and there are no lights. So I open my, my eyes again in the dream and I see this person, not the nurse, with a huge rock in their hand, they're coming to crush my head. And of course you think it's reality and you're about to die. So you have one or two reactions, you know, I read that what came to my mind. Either I will stand up and try to, to wrestle with that person, defend myself, or I would just accept my faith and pray. And then whatever happens, happens. And it, it's only three steps behind, you know, between me and that person. And during these times, I remember a very long dua, actually, uh, prayer. I don't have time to say it. <laughs> so I take a small part from it. And I say, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, A'udhu Billahi Mimma Akhafu Ahdar. You know that uh, uh, God is great, God is great, God is great. I seek refuge from uh, bad things to happen. So this person is coming now, and I see the, you know, I hear the footsteps, I feel, hear the breathing, and they're right there and on, on the top of my, my head, about to crush my head with that rock. And I continue my prayer, and suddenly the breathing stops. I hear nobody, I open my eyes. And that person is gone with the, with the door open, lights out. That's when I wake up and I see exactly the same thing, but this time with the, with the door shut. So I woke up trying to make sense of what that meant. And I was guided <coughs> to the fact that what the message I was getting is that do not fight, just pray. So from that moment on, I decided not to fight my lawyers. Let them defend it defend the case the way they see it, just pray. So I concentrated on just praying, really every day. And my wife, God bless her, you know, I gave, she gave me a book of prayers, which was very, very, very uh, helpful, you know, because that's all kinds of prayers, including the prayers when you're in a prison. And there was actually, I remember this special prayer that you have to say, it, but it says that you have to say it continuously without any interruption. And to say it actually takes about four and a half hours. And I always, you know, I, I kept delaying it because I don't have four and a hour and a half hours where I'm not interrupted. There will always be a guard someplace. So to do this, really, you have to time it 11 o'clock when they no longer come until the, 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 the medical card comes at 3.30. So these are the only four and a half hours that I could. So I kept delaying it, delaying it, delaying it until one day during my trial, I said, I have to do it tonight. There's no other way. And I, did, I finished it, alhamdulillah. And it, that prayer actually promised that Freedom would come. The, the other three, uh, dream I had was on, I remember the date, was November 11th, 2005, two days before the case went to the jury. And in that, I, I, I recited that dream actually to a friend of mine who was a pastor, who would usually come and visit with me every Tuesday. That's one of the other things <coughs> with our case is that we have a lot of non-Muslim friends <coughs> and really made a difference in our case. So he came, usually would come with my wife, and I told him that dream, uh, which I saw the following day. And it was two days before actually it went to the jury. And that, that dream, I, I saw myself in the courtroom, stripped of my clothes, except with, for my undershirt and, 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 and underpants, with a prayer rug, you know, I'm, I'm, to cover me. And then the judge is reciting the verdicts, and he's saying the verdicts of my co-defendants, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, and continuing saying not guilty, and he's refusing to say what verdict I got. So I asked, start asking my lawyer, why is he not saying anything about me? She said, wait, wait, wait. During the trial, I should say that there were 12 jurors and six alternates, and I was communicating with them through my eyes, 
all the time trying to gauge them, except that one person who would never look at me. Whenever I look at him, he would look the other day. I could never read him. He came to my dream and he whispered in my ears, he's saying, you're innocent too, you're innocent too. So I start shouting in the courtroom, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. And then suddenly everybody is out the courtroom and I'm trapped. I couldn't get out, even though I was found innocent. And then I woke up and I told him, this is what I had. Now what's in, and I saw who was the jury for person, the person who was leading. <laughs> so SubhanAllah, this about three weeks later, one day before the verdict was said, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was announced on December 6th. On December 5th, I'm called and usually we go, you know, in a cell behind the, the, the courtroom. We went there and my lawyer said, uh, the jury has a problem. I said, what is the problem? She said that they cannot agree on some, ver on some uh, charges. I said, great. And she said, we're trying to argue to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to have a mistrial. I said, why? It's going in our favor. I said, no, we cannot. Take. I said, it's, it's going in our favor. She said, how do you know this? I said, I saw it in my dream. She said, no, we argued that. That's too late. I said, why do you do this without consulting me? She said, don't worry. The government uh, <coughs> took the position you want and the, and the judge uh, granted to them. I said, so what's going to happen now? He said, he's going to bring the jury and tell them to keep deliberating. So indeed, he came and he did think something I thought was unethical because he asked for the partial verdict. And he read without us knowing 78 not guilty. There were a few other ch changes, uh, a few other charges that they were still deliberating on. So at that moment, I told my co-defendants, you know, Hassan, congratulations, Samir, congratulations. You've been declared not guilty. I said, how do you know? I said, I saw this. SubhanAllah, the following day, the, when the judge to do this, he, he stopped the uh, deliberation of the other charges, and then he started announcing not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, 78 times. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, exactly that my two, my two COVID defendants who I saw were, were out, I told them at the time that they were actually found not guilty. And of course, when I was trapped in the courtroom, I could, everybody got out except me. And that's what happened to me. I was under, under house arrest for another, you know, this was 2005 and I got out in 2015. That's 10 years waiting for this moment when you get out of that courtroom, get out of that system. So subhanAllah, it's, it was another indication of, uh, you know, of something that I, 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 I saw. And, and, the, and, you know, I told my lawyer, Linda, at the time, uh, do you know who the foreign person is? Because she was hoping that this woman African-American middle-aged woman that she, you know, she wanted her to be leading. And that's who I saw. And in 2015, I met that juror who came and whispered in my ears. And I said, Ron, what happened? Because, you know, I asked to go back, as I said, you know, I gave that khutbah in that masjid uh, uh, two weeks before I came to Turkey. So I asked him, what happened in the jury room? He said, we went to the jury room and I had next to me a, a uh, uh, one of the uh, jury members. He was a young African American lady. And that's by the way. That's that's another miracle, because the judge had five hundred people to choose from because he didn't want to have uh, you know any accusation that he was biased, because the name recognition of my case was about ninety seven percent. So it was very difficult to get impartial jury. Out of the five hundred people that he called in, were five African Americans, and three of them ended in my twelve member jury. Anyway, so he had her next to him and she asked him, how do you feel about the case? So he told her, I don't think they did anything wrong. <coughs> he said, what about you? She said, I don't think they did anything wrong either. And then she tells him, if you don't break, I won't break. And this person who came in my dream was the person defending me every single day, he was telling me. And he said, I'm sorry, we couldn't get all the charges, you know, because they weren't fine. They were 10 to two in our favor, some of the charges and the others were total acquittals. So, that person, he's the one who actually came to my dream. And I said, who was the fourth person? I was interested in that because I told him, I saw this lady to be the fourth person. Was it, was it her? He said, yes, it was. How do you know? I said, I don't know. I'm just guessing. And he, I said, how did that happen? He said, very simply, she, was, she went to the bathroom. She was the last person to enter the jury room and said, because you are the last person, you're going to be our fourth one. And I saw that two days before it actually happened. <laughs> I mean... We've got so many questions, Fanla. I'm going to try and uh, see if we can get through as many as them possible. But, yeah, Sister Amna, she asked, what kept you going in the most difficult times? I think that's an important question. Two things. Well, two things, Yanni. Of course, there are many small things here and there. But one, 
when I say faith, it's, it's a cliche, but it's not just a cliche because you have to believe in something bigger. You have to believe in something bigger and to know that the system, the people are trying to prosecute you and to try to break you and to try to crush you. That's what they want. And you say, I'm not going to give them that moment. I'm not going to let them rejoice. You know, it was a constant battle every single day and you have to maintain your cool and your patience. They want to break you down. That's what they try to do. That's what the system tried to do. So they are willing to do whatever it takes to break you down and you're fighting back by maintaining your sanity, your spirituality, your faith. And second is family. I mean, it's pure and simple. My family was, was the most beautiful thing that ever happened to me. You know, my wife, every, she never missed a visit. Just imagine. And sometimes she would go 75 miles and we denied that visit and she would still come the following day and the following day and the following day. You know, my children, you know, uh, I remember on one of my hunger strikes, they kept taking me from prison to prison. So I go to this prison way in the remote area. And they, they never even heard about hunger strike. They didn't even know how to, how to deal with the hunger strike. So I went there, I said, I'm a hunger strike. They wrote, they wrote in the report, suicide watch. The moment they said suicide watch, they stripped me of all my clothes. They gave me something called turtle suit, something very strange. You know, it's like you're a turtle. It doesn't even cover your, your knees. They took my glasses, they took everything away and I couldn't even see, I couldn't do anything, couldn't, you know, make a or anything. And they put me on an isolated cell. So one of the people who were cleaning inmates was a Muslim. So I called on him and I said, do me a favor. I dictated to him a press release. I said, give it to my son. So he called my son, gave him the press release. And the second day, the press release went viral. Thousands of calls to the prison. They didn't know what hit them. So the next day I have the prison warden, the majors, you know, the associate, everybody came to my cell asking, who are you? What's going on here? And I, you know, I told them, I'm not gonna even speak to you. If you bring you my, my clothes and my glasses, I can't even see you. So they had to actually go and, and get me my clothes. And why did that happen? Because of that commitment of people on the outside that they took that message. And because they, the switch of that prison, they couldn't work anymore because of the amount of, of, of questions and phone calls that were coming to them, that, that they make them unfunctional. So, so this, is, this is very important. And, and, and they were there every single day in the trial. They were writing, they were calling, they were traveling, they were fundraising. I mean, they did a tremendous amount of job, but <coughs> also and as many other, many other people, including so many friends, Muslim and non-Muslim, who were part of this. And I, 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 we could not have done it without, without that support, without help, without mm -hmm. the love. Uh, we got, and I want to thank everybody. Take this opportunity, actually. If this reaches those people who were with us in that fight, I want to thank every and each one of them uh, for what they've done. I think there is a uh, a documentary uh, by a Norwegian film, and it shows some of these people whom I'm very grateful to call my friends. Uh, I mean, Subhanallah, it's so amazing to to hear you speak about that that network that you have. Um, speaking about network. Uh, networks. Uh, we obviously have a lot of people in the US um, who are following this this presentation and this interview. We've got people in the UK, of course. We have people from other parts of the world. Obviously, Brother Musa, who recited the Quran, is, is joining us from Belgium. But all the way on the other side of the world, we have uh, Sister Ronda Abul Fatah from Australia, who's who's uh, joined us as well today. Mashallah. She, so she's actually asking a question. You know, Alhamdulillah. And you know, obviously, we know Sister Ronda very well. She's um, an amazing advocate for Muslims in, in, in Australia. She's very, very supportive um, of all of our causes. So she asked, when it comes to Muslims in the West mobilizing against state power, making connections between settler colonialism and race, understanding Islamophobia as systemic, not just as personal prejudice, fighting the war on terror, etc. do you think the main problem is apathy, ignorance, or fear? Very nice. Very, very good question. <laughs> you know, I, I, the reason I smile is uh, 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 apathy or ignorance, you say, I don't know and I don't care. So <laughs> it's both, both sister. A lot of it, uh, a lot of the, what's happening in, in the uh, fear is one factor, ignorance is another factor, apathy is another factor. And uh, that means that our job is, is, um, uh, is multiplied. Uh, we need to start uh, informing people, uh, reminding them of what the important things in life are and that everybody's freedom is at stake. It's not just those people 
uh, on the outside or those people who are active, who are targeted. We've seen the damage that is taking place uh, throughout uh, the different communities. We saw people who are not considered even activists being targeted simply because their name is Muhammad or Ahmed or, or Khan or something that they become immediate targets because there is a systematic uh, uh, work that has that's made the Muslim community as a suspect. Our youth are being destroyed. Our gener generations of youth now are, uh, are feeling uh, uh, that they have been stripped of their, of the, of their agency, of, of being, uh, uh, of, of their identity. And you cannot do that uh, with a community that is empowered. The whole point, the whole objective is political. It's how to disempower the Muslim community so that they cannot fight they, okay, they can be nice individuals, nice professors or nice professionals or you know, successful business people and all that. But as a community to be empowered where they could start asking for certain demands and certain policies that are going to affect a large number of Muslims that some other interest groups find this to be threatening, that is what is being fought. So to do this, we need to, to, to uh, educate our community and tell them that they need to rise up to the occasion. They need to start building institutions. You know, you mentioned Brother Hassan Shibli, who's doing a wonderful job in Florida. You know, uh, uh, Florida now is becoming, even though this case was in Florida, it's becoming one of the model, uh, it's, it's damp, it's becoming one of the model uh, 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 cities of how Muslims could be, could be empowered. You know, the mosque that we, we established today is one of the biggest mosques across the United States. The school that we, we started with 22 children, three of them were, uh, were my kids. You know, today is one of the biggest schools across the United States. That would not have happened without that commitment and, and, and dedication. You know, thousands of meals have been given and medical supplies and others uh, during this pandemic from that mosque, who at one day they would call it jihad mosque and terrorism and this and that. And today every politician is clamoring to see how they can uh, get the support and the endorsement of this mosque. Uh, based on your experience, what is the number one need for our community? What do we need to, to do to be successful, successful in the face of these government intimidation tactics? But also, what is the number, number one need from our community too? So when other, uh, others face similar situations. So those two needs, please. The need for the community and the other is? From our community. So when people are facing similar situations, what is the need for, from the community and in those situations mm -hmm. if they are faced well these are very good questions uh, when we talk about what we need to do and pre be prepared for uh, we have to understand the environment we live in we have to have the strength in the community and most importantly in the leadership to understand how they can <clears throat> take the power of the community and utilize it for the benefit of everybody not for the benefit of the of the few and that means that they have to have deep understanding first of the, their faith and second of the environment and the country and the laws that they're living in. We're doing absolutely nothing against the laws. You know, people who live in the West, who live in these communities have already decided that these are the communities they're gonna live in and they're going to die in. Meaning that they want them to be peace, uh, peaceful. They want them to be the best communities that they can be. They are living in them. They, they are having their children. They are growing them. So they need, they, they need that uh, uh, commitment. Uh, and then you need to, to uh, establish the relationship outside the community. And I think this is one of the greatest things we were able to, uh, uh, to accomplish, uh, which unfortunately other communities, when they were hit with this tsunami of, of cases that they probably didn't have or didn't anticipate. But in our case, we really had very good relationship with many churches and civil rights organizations inside Tampa, Florida, and others. You know, uh, when, uh, you know when, when we were hit with secret evidence, maybe God send us that so we get, we get prepared for the bigger one that was coming. Uh, you know, I remember, you know, when the um, NAACP, the, the largest civil uh, black African-American uh, organization across the country, when I wanted them to get into the, the secret evidence case, uh, they said, you know, we're, we're sympathized, but we don't know anything about it. And I said, how can we do, how can I do anything? He said, come and attend our conference. So I went there and attended their their, their annual conference. I was the only, I'm sure I was the only Muslim uh, and, and probably uh, you know, from, from outside the African-American uh, community, but also maybe uh, very few uh, 
non-African Americans were there. And I put a resolution down. I said, we need to condemn secret evidence. Every, it was vo voted on overwhelmingly. And the second day it was in the papers. So, this, so it was very simple act for me to join that organization, attend their conference to get a resolution out. And then with the ACLU, I was asking them, you know, the, the board, the Florida board, to, to take up this issue of secret evidence and do something with it. And every time they would say, we haven't got to it. You know, they were not very enthusiastic, at least the national was, but the, the local wasn't. So I said, when is your next election? They said, actually, it's next month. So I went, I registered, and I, I stood for election, and there was no actually candidate. So I became a board member. Then I dictated on that agenda every single time that they have to talk about secret evidence, they have to do something about secret evidence, they have put some resources behind secret evidence. So what I'm trying to tell you here is you need to get engaged with the community at large. We joined as a mosque another 19 churches. It's called Hillsborough Organization for Progress and Equality. And I got to know many, many of my friends, you know, pastors and, 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 and bishops and, and clergy people and lay people and all kinds of relationships we built. And they said, had so much respect for us as a community, because we get engaged, not just on, you know, this, this organization doesn't talk about religion. They acknowledge everybody's faith, but we start talking about social justice issues. And in that experience, you know, uh, because they respected us so much, they always start with a prayer and end with the prayer. We were one mosque with 19 churches, but they will always respect us enough to either they, st they start with the Muslim prayer or they end with the Muslim prayer. And with this organization, we were able to actually make it into a national uh, issue, the secret evidence was from a local issue into a national issue. And there's so much talk about this, but the point here is get engaged. When the trial was going on, these people who were going to the streets, raising signs and talking about our innocence while the Muslim community was being intimidated by law enforcement agencies and the FBI. It was these people, when the jurors would come out of the of the, of the courthouse, they will see them and they said, these are not from his community. They, they, the government must be hiding something. Why are these people out there? And they look like us. This is what we need to do. We need to engage with our community at large and, and, and be in, you know, we got involved in educational issues, in medical issues, in jobless issues, in, in drugs and others, because these are the, the cases that they cared about. And then we were able to bring them to care about secret evidence. It, it was mutual thing. I would go and attend them. I would go with them to Texas to, to, to find out what is the best reading program for, for young African-American children. Then they would come with me to DC to discuss uh, secret evidence. That's exactly how it happened. We need to get involved with these organizations and then we can get them to be involved in our cases. Is there a favorite quote that inspires you? Uh, I'd like that to be your last word and then I'll give my last words, inshallah. <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> there isn't one, I, you know, I, I, there are many. I and mean, so that's why it's very difficult to pick one out of many. But, uh, uh, you know, when I was in prison, I wrote a book of poetry in 2004. It was published. And uh, you'll probably find it on an uh, old uh, website, uh, perhaps as many as 80 or, or something like that uh, poems. And uh, many of them go to themes. And when you are in prison, uh, one of the surahs that you keep really reading and rereading and try to, uh, uh, to, to, to become your source in, in prison is, is the story of Yusuf. So my book of poetry is called Conspiracy Against Joseph because it, it likens the experience he had to go through with, his, uh, with, with things that happened to him when he was uh, uh, deprived of his freedom and of course of the love of his parents and so on and so forth and how he became triumphant at the end with, with the patience. So all the quotes that, <coughs> uh, that really sustain me have to do with patience, uh, but particularly the story of, of, of Sayyidina uh, Yusuf. And always with that comes at the end, you will find maybe mentioned at least five times in the surah, uh, the, uh, the, the word muhsinin or ihsan, which is the highest level that a person can reach, you know, uh, faith, you know, Islam, Iman, Ihsan. So the point of Ihsan is that uh, even those, Wallahi, I never, you know, despite, despite the pain that I had to suffer, and uh, especially when you see your family suffering, I, I didn't have this hatred that people would, would typically have against those who, who, who hurt them. I, I don't know why, you know, and, and I said that when, when I left. But again, um, there are many quotes, most of them from the Quran, from the Hadith, that uh, deal with, with, with patience. Um, 
I, I do have uh, a particular uh, affinity, you know, about uh, uh, sabr, because I think this is what, what sustains a person and uh, the true nature of, of faith. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Sami. And inshallah, that's a brilliant point to, to, to end on, to round up on. Inna Allah sabirin. Allah is with those who are patient. What patience, what better patience was there than that of Yusuf alayhi salam, who through his incarceration and one that every prisoner that I've ever come across, you know, when we used to read the surah of Yusuf alayhi salam, I used to break down in tears all the way through. Break down in tears from, not because he's thrown in prison. That's not the part that brought me to tears. The part that brought me to tears is that when his brothers meet him and they say, Yusuf, are you Yusuf? And he responds by saying, There is no vengeance upon you this day. His abusers and his oppressors never became his teachers. His teacher was uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His teacher was Yaqub alayhi salam. His teacher was the deen that, that he was upon. And the same for us, the same you've seen from the story of, of uh, Dr. Samuel al Aryan is that there's no bitterness, there's no seeking vengeance. What I'm seeking is justice and the defense of other people. And if there's one way to sum up this, one way to sum up the work of CAGE, one way to sum up the work of CCF, CCF, that is that we seek justice. We aren't seeking more, we aren't seeking less. Do not oppress and do not be oppressed. And these are the words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, impressed upon us as Muslims, uh, as human beings, as those who care for all of mankind, as we believe that the best of mankind, the Prophet said, are those who are beneficial to mankind. And what greater benefit could there be than to defend a person when they're then being, being oppressed? As the Prophet said, and uh, Sami, Dr. Sami referred to, that the best struggle, the best jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, is to speak a word against oppressive, again, against a, a tyrant. And that tyrant can indeed be a tyrannical system, an oppressive system, of which there are many. Sadly, a lot of them in the Muslim, Muslim world, many of those have been co-opted um, by um, various administrations in the US. And that is where we stand constantly fighting, not fearing the blame of any blamer, as long as we are supported, received Allah's support from the heavens and your support from the earth, from your pockets, from your du'as, and from your physical support to offer it, to volunteer for us, to point us in the right directions, to straighten us when we're wrong. Um, but Jazakumullah khair, I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts all of your deeds in these uh, last days of Ramadan. He forgives your sins, he brings us close together, he removes oppression, and he makes the world into a better place where we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he's asked us to. 